Hi, I am Jean Schumacher. I'm founder of the Weight Loss Advantage, where I help people to lose 50 to 100 pounds without dieting. And you can find my website at weightlossadvantage.co. Couldn't get the com, so I had to go at co. And I want to introduce my partner in crime tonight, Dr. Deborah Shapiro. She's a plant-based, and she's plant-based, and she's a board-certified gynecologist. And she has a website, a new view of food dot com and together we live and learn the plant-based way and dr shapiro and i are working currently working on a program called the pregnancy advantage this is where we're going to be helping ladies to become pregnant ready as well as helping people who are having difficulty getting pregnant so dr shapiro how are you this Hi. evening i'm great Thank you for having me back. This is so much fun. I'm really well, looking forward to we're, it. We're working, we're a we're team. So I love yes. connecting with you. And, you know, it's menopause. <laughs> we're still on the topic. Yes. And for anybody joining us live tonight, first of all, please do share on your timeline because you never know when you're going to help somebody. And I'm in the process of editing. I think I've already got part one. I can't remember if I got part two. You have part two. Part two is already up yes. and edited and it's on my YouTube channel. Simply Plant Based, Dean Schumacher, Simply Plant Based. Do give us a like and a thumbs up and you know, subscribe and all that good stuff. But do share this live event to your Facebook page, your timeline, or to a group, or to wherever. You know, share it with everybody because you never know who you may help. So we've had a lot of questions that came in you know, because of menopause. I mean, it's a hot topic. Oh my gosh. In part two, we discussed we were talking about different algaes and we were talking about hijinki and that it contains potentially toxic quantities of inorganic arsenic. You know, there's just no other way to, to get around it. So a uh, Dr. McDougall discusses for rice, you know, there are some types of rice that have arsenic in it. And that was primarily because of a lot of places in the South started starting, you know, changing to, cotton from cotton to rice and they used a lot of chemicals you know in processing the cotton so that got absorbed by the rice anyway he talks about you know to reduce the arsenic in rice that he talks about cooking the rice like a pasta and that's going to help to reduce the arsenic because the arsenic is going to go out and then you kind of rinse it you know like a pasta what about doing the same thing for hijiki? What, what are your thoughts on this? Right. One of the things I would add also about why rice, even California grown rice, might have more arsenic or might have more arsenic than we'd like it to is because there's a chemical that's fed to chickens to make them grow faster. And that contains arsenic. I don't know why arsenic, I don't know why this works. But so they use chicken manure as fertilizer, even oh. on organic rice. Okay. So it's not just rice that's cooked in the South, but you can ask, I believe that some California rice might have less, like the Lundberg rice might mm -hmm. have less, but certainly for babies, you have to watch out for that. You know how we always used to feed babies after, as their first food, rice cereal? Now they're right. really, really saying not to because they have too much arsenic. So hijiki, is a seaweed that uh, Dr. Gregor just says we should just stay away from. But I did find one article from Japan, and it is in Japanese, about a potential method for reducing the arsenic in hijiki seaweed. And it okay. has to do with, like you said, with just boiling it. So you can boil it in cold water, cold distilled water. They also talked about boiling it multiple times in seawater, and they got good reductions in arsenic. But the problem is if you go out to a restaurant, and you order hijiki seaweed, they're not going to do this, most likely. I mean, no. you ask whether they try to reduce the arsenic in their seaweed, but they probably don't. But if you're going to have it at home, then that would be something if you felt really inclined to have it. But there are other, like wakame and arame and nori. There are other seaweeds, other sea vegetables that are safer. Kelp is also very high, um, but you just have to use a tiny amount. And I think last time we were also talking about the, the seaweed the, that we put in for cooking beans which is kombu. that? The kombu. kombu, which is also on the higher side for iodine, not, not right. for arsenic, but for iodine. Right. right. And so you should just have a small amount of that. Um, right. But the reason we were talking about sea vegetables in the first place was because we do need 150 micrograms of iodine 
a day. And right. If you're going to be pregnant, you need to make sure that you're getting enough iodine to keep your thyroid healthy. And so you can either, if, if you're okay with a pinch of iodized salt, but someone like yourself might not be using any salt at all, nope. then you need to get these sea vegetables. So wakame, arame, nori, a splash of, of kelp powder, and be careful about getting too much from, um, from the other. Yeah. No, I thought I just put a little bit into, I make my own dressing. So I just threw some in right. there because, and I soaked it first just for, just to, you know, get it hydrated. Yes. And I thought it didn't, I don't like a fishy taste. You right. know, I'm not a fishy seafood-ish kind of person. So that would have turned me right off. But I did not taste, you know, it didn't have a fishy taste in my recipe, which was fabulous. So, right. cause I really need to, I'm concerned about my, my thyroid. Because, mm -hmm. and that's one of the issues, and we're starting to see a lot of issues with thyroid, and mm -hmm. iodine is one of them. And right. just going back to, and I, and I can't help it, I'm a, this is the chemistry teacher, and I don't think we talked about this before, but if you look on the periodic table, and you look where iodine is, mm -hmm. iodine is in group 7A, it's the halogens. I can't help it, I'm a chemistry teacher. So it's in group 7A, it's the top. It is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. Okay, meaning that it's most responsive. And if you look down in, in terms of activity level series, anything below fluorine is going to be lower. So fluorine is going to kick it out in a chemical reaction. So below fluorine is chlorine, then bromine, then iodine. So if fluorine and iodine are in the same chemical reaction you know, within your body, then here's what's going to happen. The fluorine is going to kick out the iodine. It's a single displacement chemical reaction that's taking place in your body. Mm. Why is that important to me? I'm so glad you asked. Deborah. you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you for I'm thinking <laughs> fluoridated water. I'm thinking, yes. right? Yes. Exactly. And in, I'm in the state of New York, and they still fluoridate their water, which to me is just, I, I just go nuts, you know. And I, and I think this could be, now, do I have any data backing this up? Um, no, but it's a, this is a chemical reaction. This is a fact. Fact. Fluorine will displace iodine in a chemical reaction. Single displacement, chemical, fact. So if you're drinking fluoridated water and you've got fluorine, you know, this is something I discussed with, you know, Dr. Neil Barnard, you know, about this and, you know, and he agrees. And he thinks there's more, you know, need more study, more studies done, because I don't think I've not read anything. He's not read anything in terms of the fluoridated water, but I would not be surprised if this were the case, because you are talking about a halogen. It is the most electronegative element there is. Ms. Schumacher, so. can, I ask, can I ask a question? Yes, little girl. <laughs> Actually, it's not true that there's no, no there's no data. It's very interesting that you mentioned this because there just was a study that came out about how uh, fluor fluoride is possibly related to knocking IQ points off of babies. Did you see that? I yes. have not, but, that, but that's talking about IQ points. I'm talking about it having an impact on, on the thyroid. Well, but, th but they're related because um, sure. our in children that are born, if you have low, if you have low iodine and, right. and then the babies have, have cretinism and I think they have lower IQ. So I, th I don't know if, I don't know, if, I don't know if they're exactly related, but there's, there is something. There's, there is before. something. I mean, but not, I don't know, necessarily tied in with Nobody the thyroid. Knows. Nobody you know? said, right. They, all they noticed about is about the, the fluoride. Right. And, and, and so I'm just, I would be curious in that study with that showing the lower IQ points, is there a relationship with the thyroid? Is the thyroid functioning normally? That would be one question I would have, okay? Yes, it's um, interesting, very Dr. interesting. Dr. Neil yeah. Barnard, if you're listening out there, uh, we need to be doing studies on this, so can we like get that on the agenda for right. PCRM? So moving on, getting back to some of the questions that we were still trying to get through and work through because menopause just is one of those absolutely amazing topics okay question during menopause do women and i can't remember if we talked about this do women typically experience more utis during and after menopause oh we did talk about it we did talk about it last time yes because i thought we did because the vaginal okay the whole vulva becomes more uh, becomes thin the the mucosa the skin over the vulva becomes 
thinner and less elastic right. and there are these microscopic tears that happen with intercourse and and even and but of course 90 percent of utis can be can be actually traced back to e coli from chicken we uh, talked about that just blew me away I, right and you can even just handling chicken handling chicken i will go right into your system Handling it, eating it, yes, uh, yes. Well, they tell you not to handle the chicken, right? Right. Well, and even like if I'm, I, I still use a little bit for mo mostly seasoning for my dog when I'm cooking food for for my dog. I just use a little bit, and don't send me hate mail, okay, please. But I wear gloves when I handle the chicken mm -hmm. because I, absolutely, I mm -mm -mm, no, don't right. want to be handling this 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 bacteria. Absolutely incredible, and it, it has a direct impact on the gut biome. Yes, we did talk about that. So we talked about it. Yes. We can, so let's right. move on. So if you if you're interested, in, in, I think that was in part two. I don't know why I have that question on here tonight, but anyway, That's like fine. I said, this is not the best time of year to be talking to me because like my brain is on you know woo going back to school. Wow, my thought brain. Anyway, you don't want to talk. So to my hats off to you though for what you do. I have <laughs> you tremendous respect to for teachers. Yeah, you don't want to talk to the teacher just before school starts because they're 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 a crazy person. <laughs> Once we get rolling and we're in the school year, it's great. You know, life is good. So, what are your thoughts? Because this is a big topic, and I see this come up again and again and again. Is phytoestrogens right? Because that this is a huge topic. You know, oh my God, we're gonna get cancer. It's estrogen. You know. First of all, talk about what it is, and then does it help during menopause? And if so, where should we get these phytoestrogens? Take it away, doc. Phytoestrogens. So, <laughs> what's funny, you know, because I am a board certified OBGYN, so it's it's interesting that my college, the American Congress of OBGYN, does ACOG does not really sit, does not agree that soy or phytoestrogens help significantly with hot flashes and night sweats. But there have been thousands of studies looking at, at phytoestrogens and especially genistein, genistein, which is one of the components of soy, one of the phytoestrogens. So they're called, so a phytoestrogen is a plant sterile, a plant estrogen, and it's called that because it actually looks like estradiol. If you look at the chemical structure, which I'm sure you could probably just draw the board from scratch, but it's very, very similar to estrogen. So it fits in a receptor, but not the alpha receptor where estradiol fits, but it fits into the beta receptor. And we only knew about the beta receptor until I think 1996. So it was three years after I'd already been in practice, mm -hmm. talking about hormones and all that in my practice for years, and not even realizing that there were these two estrogen receptors, one that the phytoestrogen sit on, which is preferentially the um, beta receptor. And that actually keeps in some ways it keeps breast tissue from from being stimulated by estrogen so by your own estradiol for example and so the question specifically was about the role of the role of phytoestrogens yeah i mean apparently apparently if you use about 19 milligrams of genistein as a supplement there might be a significant reduction in hot flashes now my College does not agree with that, but I think for, for a lot of, because there's always going to be a placebo effect and there's going to be people who react and don't react. And actually, if you eat a lot of plant foods, you might actually become something called an equal producer, E-Q-U-O, E-Q-U-O-L, where you actually turn soy estrogens into equal, where you, which is even a stronger phytoestrogen. And that might be one reason, you know, that people in Japan actually do have less. If they do have less, there's some argument about that. Maybe that people from some Asian countries actually just complain about hot flashes less than other, other they feel less inclined to complain about hot flashes. We don't actually know if they actually have less or they just like complain about them less, but it could be that they are more likely to be equal produ uh, producers. And so they have, they make this stronger phytoestrogen that helps them with hot flashes as well. I don't know. But people in Japan have about 30 to 50 milligrams of phytoestrogens a day. We have maybe a few grams of phytoestrogen. So I would definitely always recommend, so, and there's about 25 grams of phytoestrogens in a soy, in a serving of soy, like a, a cup of soy milk or a, sub, a cup of yogurt or um, a half a cup of edamame. And so I would try, yes. Yeah, so in Japan, they consume about 30 to 50 milligrams of phytoestrogens or isoflavones, and we only get maybe 
a few grams. So I would definitely recommend two servings of whole soy food. So that's soy milk. And I, some are slightly processed like tofu and tempeh and amame. So you can get canned soybeans or you want to get, of course, organic soy. So it's not covered in glyphosate, which destroys your gut bacteria, any kind of minimally processed soy product that's organic would contain these phytoestrogens, isoflavones, another word for them, um, genistein particularly, because it's mostly, um, there's genistein and dazine and uh, glycetine, but it's mostly genistein that has been tested. I saw there was one study that actually ACOG talked about that was with red clover, um, estrogens from red clover, and they said it didn't work for hot flashes. I wouldn't, I don't even know where people would get red clover. I suppose maybe if you went to a an herbalist, they'd say red clover extract. Well, it doesn't work. But supposedly 19, 19 milligrams of genistein does. Okay. Okay. Well, but I just want to jump in. And if anybody's out there listening and wants to increase the amount of soy that, that's in that, especially for menopausal people, so yogurt is a great way to do that. But if you buy it commercially prepared, you're going to get a lot of either chemicals or sugar added, stuff like that, that you don't want. So an easy way to do it, and if you go on Simply Plant Based under videos, we did a show with Kim Campbell, and in the fifth episode, we did she shows and demonstrates how easy it is to make soy yogurt. Literally, before you go to bed, you take a, a box of soy yogurt, put it in four dish, you know, glasses, and you add one of the the bacteria to each one of the glasses, put it in the instant pot, and overnight it will make yogurt so you'll have yogurt you know fresh yogurt in the morning so i know so i know yeah i was testing you to see if you were paying attention i am always so, paying attention to you clearly i like that's why i like you <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway but you can make your own soy yogurt so easy to do and then i think in the eighth show she found some little kitchen gadgets you know and she found one of these contain things that you can put the yogurt in once you create the yogurt you put it in on top, let all the liquid fall out, and you have the solid. And you can use that as a creme fraiche kind of thing. You can use it as a base for like almost like a sour cream or a cream cheese. You know, that whole texture, it's amazing depending on how thick or thin you want it to be. So there's a lot you can do with that. Oh, my God. And then adding it to recipes like to make a creamy Italian dressing, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, my God. So there's so many things that you can do with it. You know, it, and and it's and it's not and it's good for you. It's good for you. So exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just wanted to you know pop that out and let people know Fantastic. about that. Fantastic. Yes. Yes. So. Absolutely. So soy. There's a there's a lot of misinformation about soy and cancer, yes. and one of the reasons is that they used to do this. Is I didn't even know this. I I recently went to a conference in uh, at DC. It was the PCRM. International Conference oh. on Nutrition and Medicine, and then a wonderful RD talking about soy. And he explained that originally the research that we're relying on about soy and cancer was from rodents, and rodents deal with phytoestrogens differently. So oh yes, so they may, you know, it it may it may increase cancer in rodents, but we are not rodents, and we don't handle them differently. And so it, actually, for humans, it reduces your risk of breast cancer. But what I used to tell people. And this was actually a little bit wrong. I used to tell people when they come to me in their 30s and 40s and 50s, if you eat more soy, you'll reduce your risk of breast cancer. But what's really important is to get soy when you're young. Mm. So that's where they saw the biggest reduction in breast cancer, between 5 and 11. If you give soy products to kids, to so little girls between the ages of 5 and 11, you're going to have a 60% reduction in breast cancer. A 60% reduction in breast cancer when they're older. And when you give it to crazy. I know. Just by doing something by by incorporating a, a food a into their food. diet. Yeah. A whole a food healthy, into their diet. That's a healthy food. Yes. You know, you know, if kids have if, if teenagers start having soy later, let's say someone comes to veganism and they start eating more soy later in life, uh, eleven to you know, nine or twelve to nineteen, there's gonna be a twenty four percent reduction. I'm sorry, a 20% reduction. So it's a big difference between 60% and only 20%. So definitely, if you if you weaning your child from breast milk, get them onto soy. There is no reason to deny them that. And the same, you know, wow. we know from the from the Adventist two health study that when men had more soy, there was much less prostate cancer. 
also. So yeah. it was only, there's some extreme cases where men were, were drinking, consuming gallons and gallons of soy milk, and there might have been some change in their in their hormones from that, but in a bad way, there may be some feminization, but nothing like what you would have just by having a couple of, a couple of uh, products of soy a day. Lastly, I just want to say that in terms of people who've already had breast cancer, in 2012, the American Cancer Society and the American Institute for Cancer Research decided that it was okay for women who had breast cancer to, to use soy, to have soy. I still have patients telling me all the time, I had, I had breast cancer, I can't be on soy. But that was 2012. And then by 2014, they agreed that it actually helped prevent a recurrence. So if you've had breast cancer, even if you are a BRCA mutation, if you're a carrier of a BRCA mutation, and that, that BRCA gene is the one that, that helps with uh, repairing DNA, mm -hmm. it would be healthy and, and actually advantageous for you to be having more soy. Two soy products a day would be advantageous and would keep you from, it would help you to pre prevent a recurrence because it, it upregulates the beta receptor, it downregulates the alpha receptor, it helps to, to repair, it helps with that gene, that BRCA gene to make that work more so to help with dna repair so only good things from soy i i don't i i don't know really who's behind this slandering of soy but it really should stop tonight <laughs> soy is and you heard it here first and you can look it up it's yep. not, you know, well and that's the thing there's a lot of stuff out there but but there's a lot of misinformation out there too oh yeah oh yeah so so, so, so these phytoestrogens, I want to just go back a little bit. They're, they're, it's not exactly like estrogen. Uh -huh. it's, it's like a selective estrogen receptor modulator, a CIRM. And you know, people use selective estrogen receptor modulators when they have breast cancer. Tamoxifen is a good example of a CIRM. So you could think of phytoestrogens as a selective estrogen receptor modulator, like tamoxifen or raloxifene. And these are things that we use to prevent cancer because they sit in the, because they, they selectively sit in the beta receptor and they prevent, they prevent the, uh, the alpha receptor from being stimulated in the same way. So they help prevent, they help prevent cancer, not, they don't promote cancer of the breast at all. And they actually don't act in the uterus. So unlike Tamoxifen, which can stimulate the uterus, it's a weak estrogen in the uterus. It's more like raloxifene in some ways that it, it's an anti-estrogen also in the uterus. It doesn't cause uterine cancer or uterine hyperplasia or anything. Wow, but you're amazing. Other than, no, I just I was studying this a little bit and I heard a really great lecture, so I'm not amazing. So the the other thing I wanted to say about soy is that it helps with depression. So being on a plant-based diet also helps with depression. That was that was shown in the one of the studies that PCRM did actually at Geico, right? They, they had a whole they looked at, at depressive scores when people were on plant-based diets, and they definitely saw a reduction. A friend of mine, Olka Agarwal, did that study, and it's always they 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 talk about it all the time. This is such a great study, but also soy not only works to prevent to, to help with depression, but also it, it helps sort of synergistically with antidepressive medications to work better. So that's very good. And also soy protein reduces cholesterol. Soy protein, not the, not the phytosterol. But I want to caution people. It's not the processed stuff. Like the oh, soy you know, protein isolate, right? Like the like power the, bars that have soy protein isolate. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no. We're talking about as close to eating like edamame or yeah. like soy milk, things like that. You so know. Tempeh, tempeh is great because it's also a fermented soy product. Right. So that's also a, you know, a, a, a prebiotic because it's, it's fermented. Right. 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 Well, the yogurt said, too. Said, yogurt yes. too. Yes. Yep. So you're getting a double, double dose. You're getting the, you know, the, the probiotic there. And you're getting the, the soy benefits. So right. two for one. Two for the price right. of one. So right. soy yogurt, very good. But don't get the commercially paired stuff. Make it yourself. It's so easy. Okay. Yes. Instant pot game changer. Okay. Now, my father used to make it in the oven just with the pilot light. Do you think that's still possible? Yeah, yeah absolutely. But you know, my pilot light, maybe because the ovens have changed, you know. Yeah, maybe they don't have pilot lights anymore. No, maybe they don't. I think they do because I have a gas stove and you still have, you, you've got the pilot light on. I don't know if it just sparks it or you mm -hmm. still have it because I don't think I remember it, my oven being that hot. I don't know. I, you know, I, I just think back in the day it did. You had that pilot right. light, which was enough warmth. You don't need a lot of warmth. Right. Just, you need right. A, just a gently warming area for the bacteria to start growing and multiplying, and you're good to go. That's I used, that you're doing. 
I used to make tempeh in the waterbed. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. So we make tempeh the same way you take soybeans and you mix in a starter, a tempeh starter, and yeah. then you spread it into a casserole dish and we yeah. just stick it at the bottom of the waterbed under the, you know, under the sheets where it was just warm and had tempeh. I know. TMI probably. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. First of all, we don't have water beds. I mean, you know, that, that phase oh, went out with bell it, bottoms. and It and, was uh, so comfortable. I had it all through my residency. It was like a little cocoon. I don't know. I saw a fan. Okay, so what about soy and thyroid? People are always saying that they have thyroid, but they heard that soy would be bad for your thyroid, that it was a goitrogen, that it was going to cause a problem. But it turns out that's only true if you, if you aren't getting enough iodine. So if the... Uh, if the phytoestrogen can be iodinated, is what it's called, so an iodine can be attached to it, and that's a chemical we actually even know about, then it does not cause a problem with this hormone called thyroperoxidase, which turns T3 and T4 into T3. So you do need to get enough iodine. So in the in the in the face of normal of a normal, you have a normal iodine intake. Uh, there should be absolutely no problem with getting soy, and in fact, it's very healthy. Well, we talked about easy way to get the, the soy, you know, the soy yogurt, eat in tempeh, edamame, you know, those kinds of things. But you don't want the, the ice soy, protein, soy isolate. Protein. You know, that's like that textured protein, you know, things like that. That I, I remember getting this when I lived in Colombia. They had, a, I don't know where they got this from, but it was a great source of protein, you know, the textured soy protein. And it, when you reconstituted it, it looked just like, you know, like ground hamburger. And we used to use it like in spaghetti sauce and things like that. But this is where you're getting a lot of the processing. And this is not good for you. It's, it's very processed stuff. So you want to stay away from those kinds of things, those protein bars, the whey protein. Oh, please don't even get me started on that. I, my students. Well, whey is from dairy. So we don't. don't talk, I know. Don't talk to me about the whey protein because I go I go crazy. That and if they bring Gatorade in front of me, you know, I go I go crazy. Um, so anyway, <laughs> all right. <laughs> not that I'm not crazy already, because I yeah, mm -hmm, yep, yep. I've been teaching a long time, so part of the brain cells are warped. I don't know. I think it's sad about Gatorade because you know they still recommend it to people when they're dehydrated, and I you know you just it's just. Hey, I just roll my eyes. I just absolutely roll my eyes. And, you know, like we went back to school and it's not just Gatorade. I mean, like the sugar, the amount of sugar that's in Gatorade just is, is off the charts. And one of my peers, you know, and I, I harass him all the time. And t we were in the teacher's room and he, he'd be sitting there filling out some papers and he had a can of soda, you know, a, a, like a cola, dark cola in front of him. Mm -hmm. And I just went over and I picked it up. I didn't even say a word. And he just no. was like, he's like, to stop stop right now i know i'm just a little stressed you know and i and i didn't say a word i didn't say a word i just went hmm and i pointed to how much sugar was in there and i'm like how much sugar is that for the day hmm. yeah. and they're still nice to you there <laughs> he and i i don't do that to just anybody oh, okay. <laughs> you know? this is just one teacher that i've got a good relationship with you know and i can tease about this and you know and harass and and uh and get away with it so you know, we have, we have fun, you know, joking back and forth, you know, kind of thing. But anyway, so is there any benefits to being plant-based during menopause? Well, there are actually, of course, plant, there are benefits to being plant-based at all times. So we can just start at the top. Okay. Let's, let's right, think about right. it. Um, we, so, because, because there are a lot of illnesses that, that you know, your, your risk goes up with age, right? So Alzheimer's and stroke and diabetes and, and heart attacks and gall gallstones and gall gallbladder disease and uh, liver liver disease and kidney I mean, disease everything That's pretty much right oh I missed so all the things that are spe specifically more for older people would be things like um, macular degeneration macular degeneration and and um, um, so uh, gastrointestinal problems uh, inflammatory bowel so. I would say that there are benefit. So all of these are, are lower lower risk in in in, um, in, in plant based when you when you're using plant based nutrition. And so I would start early if possible. I think you should start at any time. I would I would love to see people who are plant based before they get pregnant even, and that's because of uh -huh. epigenetics as well. But also 
uh, raising your children plant-based and then just keep having plant-based kids becoming plant-based adults and they're all, we're just going to see such, we could see not only a reduction in global warming and greenhouse gas emissions, but also healthcare costs would come down and we, and it is staggering and we're, we're worried about that now. And, and, and the, the answer is just at the end of your fork. I don't, but people are still struggling with this. I don't really understand. They keep saying it's too hard. It's too hard. And I love me too much. I love me too much. And I, it's, uh, I suppose I, I do have compassion because I, I was raised on crap. You know, I was raised on crap, spam and, and bologna. And I know. I still. Pop tarts. And I could, right. I was raised totally on crap. Desserts were pudding and, and, and jello and all kinds of dyes and, it's sad, but, 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 and it was a time it turned out as normal as you did. Maybe I could have been better. That's the problem. <laughs> think of what could have been. But when I think about the first time that I met vegans and I thought, oh, how thin <laughs> and how, and, right. And how impossibly slim they were. And also how extreme it was. And I remember meeting other vegans and just thinking, oh yeah, but I, I'm a foodie. I, I, I really, so but today, Something. I mean, I get it in the in the day. But today, I you know now there's like Beyond Meat. Okay, there's all these meat substitutes, and some of them scary look like meat. Oh, I know. Like they really close to to looking like it, and they I have mean, the fat content to prove it. <laughs> right? right. Exactly. Right. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's a better choice for the planet. These yes. meat substitutes and things like that. I just saw like KFC now has yes. a yes. a chicken meat. nugget. Yeah, yes. I, yeah, that's Isn't that amazing. I would never have thought. And the Subway has a meatball sandwich that's from, I think, a Beyond Meat or some other. And I think uh, Burger King has, I think, right. the Beyond Burger they're and getting, McDonald's has. Yes. Yeah, they're getting on the bandwagon. But please don't, you know, confuse these with healthy things. No. Please. Okay. This is not a healthy choice, okay? But it is healthy. But it is healthier for the environment. But it may not give no you question. the longest life because if you just the longest life, the longest healthiest life, because they still have a lot of saturated fat. I mean, if you just have this as a one-time treat, okay, fine. But if this, if you're making this, your your, you know, every day you're going and getting this stuff. This is not going to be a health choice, and you're going to end up with a lot of the same health issues, you know, that people that are eating animals. But I will give it, it's going to be better for the planet. No questions asked, you know. But in terms of your long-term health, yeah, you might want to rethink this. It's a transition food, you know, like to help you transition. And once you start, you know, coming over to the plant-based side and you start feeling better, I mean, that's the thing. Okay. And like it is as low as 10 days, you mm -hmm. can start to see changes. And I just got a shout out. And I know we're talking about thinning hair. Mm -hmm. you know, in terms for menopause. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to give a shout out to one of my newest members for the Weight Loss Advantage. She's had an issue where she lost her hair for a long time. It's coming back. Ah, it's coming back, her hair. Right. Well, I, I think my hair was thinner also before I became plant-based and a cleaner plant-based. You know, was it like you said? It was a transition, right? Crap, and then and then more dairy and more fish, and I, right. I had mercury poisoning and all of that, and then and then just becoming a you know a diet coke kind of a vegan, and then finally getting getting rid of all the trying to get rid of all the chemicals, and right. really because of you, I probably bought new products for my face that didn't have the parabens and the all that stuff. I mean, I was trying to get stuff that wasn't wasn't tested on animals because I'm ethically vegan, but but still to try to get things that were also right. things like. Right, that we're safer. So, we, if you want to talk about hair for a minute, did we did we cover? Are we done? Are we did we did we finish up the phytoestrogens? I think so. We no, we're talking about what are the benefits? We were on the benefits of being plant based during menopause. I just right. have to oh, say there are others, myself. right? I just have to say for myself, I just noticed you know within my own time because I was transitioning you know in my early fifties to living plant based. So I think I had very, very few side effects of going, of going through menopause, you know, uh, and I have to say there were very few hot flashes. There was, you know, not hardly any symptoms. My emotions, on the other hand, were another story. You know, those were all over the place. Not all the time. But if I got upset, it was like 
exacerbated like you know to jedi level and my poor husband you know had to to deal with this crazy person you know who couldn't control emotions and you know crying crying oh my god you know and i tried not to and it frustrated me beyond belief because i had no control over it you know and, and couldn't uh -huh. stop but now like now that i'm past that you know i'm pretty even keeled in terms of of you know emotions in that sense but Everyone experiences the symptoms of menopause very differently. I know that with hot flashes, we hadn't really talked about it before, but with hot flashes, people often feel very anxious. And I have to say that when I've had hot flashes, I've also had incredible anxiety with the hot flash. Do you, do, have you experienced that also? Just this I, wave of anxiety that comes sometimes with a hot flash. So. I just think more, more that, you know, I didn't have many. But when I did, it was like, oh my God, rip my clothes off, right, you know, right. kind of thing. You know, it was just right. like, you couldn't get cool, you know, and it was like, can I just go stand in a freezer? Right. I mean, you know, let uh, me go roll in the snow someplace. Can I go like to same. Antarctica for a couple of yeah. minutes? You know, yeah. I didn't really experience, I didn't experience that quite as much. I've had some night sweats that were horrible and I definitely experienced more night sweats than I get warm during the day, but I would just be able to take something off. But, uh, but uh, I have listened to people complain that they would just, just explode in redness and sweat. Yeah. They wouldn't be able to function at their work and give, and give presentations. They lose confidence and, and yeah. And it was very, very, very challenging for people. You, can, you can see it. You can see it rising, you know, like in some people that it's really right. severe. You can right. just see this flush going up and it's like, woo, that's, you know, woo, right. not her way. That's coming. Woo. But the emotional ability is very, is very, is, is very difficult also. Yeah. Sounds like you had that more. I, everybody is different. And right. that's why sometimes people actually do need to be on a little bit of, hormone replacement therapy, uh, sometimes they do. So if they're completely miserable, I wouldn't withhold it. There are, other, there are alternatives, and we, you, know, you can talk about that with your doctor. But it, I think for a short time, being on something to keep you a little more on an even keel, if it, if it makes your life easier, I don't, I don't think that's the end of the world. I don't think, I think that's okay. Okay. So what are some of the other benefits? Of being plant-based during menopause. Well, so I think I think now we can talk about the gut, the microbiota, right? And right. actually, PCRM. I just saw that they had a a podcast now about the microbiome and also the gut-brain axis and everything. But ninety percent of your serotonin is made in your gut. Seventy percent of your immune system is in your gut, but ninety percent of your serotonin it goes through the blood vessels and goes up to your brain and diffuses, you know, through through the blood brain barrier and so that's what's going to keep you and also dopamine also and these are all the feel-good hormones they're, they're made by gut bacteria they're not actually they're made by gut bacteria so you want to have the most healthy microbiome which is going to be the most diverse microbiome you want to have lots of different species and the way to do that is to have a, a very varied plant-based diet so I actually challenged myself and I challenged people on Facebook to try to fit as many different plants into their day as possible, plus fungi, right? Plus uh, eating from the rainbow. Right. And, and it's interesting how many we can fit in, right? In a salad. I mean, it's not just the old salad of tomatoes and carrots and, and lettuce. I mean, I put, I put right. salads together that have 30 or more components. Right. A lot of chopping, but it, it, but it tastes delicious. And I really feel well, quite virtuous. The best salad is one that somebody else makes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. But I know well, I actually I like to prepare them. I do. I'm not a big I'm not a big cook. So my wife actually does much more of the actual cooking and I do more just eating. Poke, yeah, yes, but also composing. So Okay. I don't work my with husband, fire too much. <laughs> well, my husband just came home uh, not too long ago. And he stopped and got salads at Chopped, which is a... In the oh, yes, I know Chopped. Over. Yeah. I yeah. love Chopped. Oh, my God. So amazing. I just want to have a shout out to Rachel Huffman Moore. She said the Beyond Meat is horrible for people. You know, the fat... Right. Colors, it's, they, they have an incredible amount of oil, the fat that's in there, plus the salt, you know, and I don't know how much sugar if it's in there. No, I don't think but so. She does but, say it is very yummy. I haven't tried it. I can't. I just oh no, but, you wouldn't be able to. But my in-laws love it, and it's actually at a lot of restaurants around. And right. I remember, the, and my in-laws who are eighty-five and eighty-seven, they love it. And I, I consider that sort of a win in a way. My father-in-law has uh, uh, some kidney issues and vascular issues, and I, I think that there might be a little bit of an improvement without the animal it's proteins. A right. It's a transition. Right. It's a transition food. And a treat. So. Yes. 
Absolutely. I like how, how uh, Neil Barnard talks about how his parents went, went plant-based. And there's a difference between vegan and plant-based, in case yes. you don't know that. You know, primarily you're eating, you're not eating animal-based products, but there's a lot of processed foods. On whole foods, you're eating foods as close to nature as possible, whereas as vegans will tend to, not always, but, you know, will have these processed foods, which, as many of us have found out, are not very healthy for us. So, you know, there is a difference, you know, in that. So there's a lot I of to- foods. But, but Neil talks about how his parents, his mom you know, does all the shopping. So like she would go and buy the bread and make this, you know, and get those fake, you know, meat slices and put it into the sandwich. And his father's like, well, it's not, you know, this is not a very good quality meat there, you know. <laughs> and he had no clue that he was vegan, you know, wow. that he, was actually, he had gone vegan. He had no clue. Amazing. Amazing. Just a, a little difference also about being vegan on you because it always comes up and they use it in such a divisive way. It's so interesting. People will get onto a, onto a website and say, you know, that's not, it's not vegan. It's plant-based. And I, I, but I, so veganism really has to do with more than just what you eat or what you don't eat. Right. So veganism is really a whole lifestyle. You have any rates. So being vegan just has to do with trying to avoid it's ethical products. It's more ethical. And I have definitely gotten into some arguments with people who are ethically vegan and don't care what the hell you eat really. And, and it's so interesting because I'm trying to say, if you want to, if you want to promote veganism, you right. better be healthy right. because if you're dying young from heart disease and diabetes, because you're just eating vegan crap, that's not going to be good. But I definitely know people who don't care. Right. They just want you to avoid animals. So I, I, mean, I don't Coca-Cola. Eat and Chips Oreos and Oreos, yes, and you can live on that. And people, some people are very happy if you do that because you're because right. So, but yeah. being whole, trying to eat more whole plant foods, that's the healthiest diet. And if you could also be ethically ethically vegan and not buy products that are tested on animals and not go to rodeos and and you know run with the bulls in Pamplona. I mean, if you could do all that and eat a whole plant food diet, that would be the best. That's <laughs> the combination. Exactly. Okay. And a lot of the leaders in this field, I think, are. I know the Clapper is. There are a lot of people. I know, of course, Neil Barnard is. There are a lot of people in the, in the whole plant, Neil and Brenda Davis also. There are people who are leaders in this field. They talk about nutrition all the time. But behind the scenes, behind the scenes and sometimes in their lectures too, they are also ethically vegan. And I think that's a great combination. Right. It's because great. animals, in any case, when they're dealing with, with humans, usually get the short end of the stick. Yeah. It's not a good life. Right. So... Okay, so are we done with uh, benefits of being plant-based during menopause? Do we hit all the... No, I think we can always talk about more. I mean, emotions, it helps you to, you'll sleep better, and sleep yeah. is affected, of course, right? You'll sleep better. Your sex life will probably be better um, because when you eat more plants, you're opening up your blood vessels and you're going to get more uh, oxygen even to your genitals. And we see this with men all the time who, are, who, have, who suffer from erectile dysfunction until they go plant-based and then... They, then it goes away and they can have an erection. So the same thing with, with women's sex or, or organs as well. And gut microbiome, of course, serotonin, but also just a healthier gut because you're not exposed to, to the endotoxins in meat. And well, we'll think about something else, but I think that. All right. Well, here's a good question because as you're going through some, especially some people, as you're going through menopause, am I ever going to feel normal again? Ever. Yes. So hot flashes can last a long time. It's true. The hot flashes and the night sweats and the mood swings, it can, it can certainly last years. It's quite variable. Sure. But I'm really hoping that you'll feel better than normal because you won't have to be burdened by this endless cycle of bleeding and buying tampons and pads and bleeding through things and worrying about you know what, and being bloated and 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 I don't miss it. breasts are hurting. And do you remember all that PMS where your breasts were hurting? And and yes, if something touched oh. you, you know, I remember. And also for me, having heavy heavy menses and 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 bleeding onto you know having to sleep on a towel one day a month and and no, also I just I don't miss it at all. Right. And just yeah, I mean, and just having that not have to worry about, you know, carrying something, you know, in case, you know, you started or whatever. Right. Or being or pregnant or getting pregnant. About it. Or getting right? pregnant. The, of course. Oh, yeah. oh. I mean, I don't worry about that, but I didn't for a while. But I, when I did, I mean, that was, that was a huge issue. So for women who are heterosexual, I think it's a huge issue just to be free from that. So you could just be sexual, 
and not worry. And you can, so you can be productive and not have to worry about being reproductive. <laughs> so, well, I, can't, I can't even imagine like my mother was in, I think she was in her mid forties when she got pregnant with me. And I just can't even imagine my poor mother, you know, like right. going to the doctor and like, oh, oh, I'm not feeling well. And he's like, you're pregnant. What? <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, but look what happened. Well, I, okay. But yeah, right. but I just, I think back, you know, when I hit my mid forties and I was like, oh, I can't even imagine being pregnant and having a child in my mid forties. Oh. A lot of people are, I mean, as an obstetrician, I'd have to say, I've seen, there are a lot of women who are delaying childbearing. They're even where I work, they're even freezing their eggs so that they, cause they know they're going to be delaying childbearing until right. after the ideal time. So they're going to do it later and you know, more power. Does to that them. work freezing the eggs? Yeah. Maybe not quite as well as freezing embryos, but it does. Absolutely. It does. It does. Okay. Good yeah. to know. But if How you, long if can your eggs let, you know, keep in, in frozen? I don't know exactly. You could get in touch with an, inf uh, an infertility clinic to see. I, I can't I'm imagine. Curious. Well, they could mess up. I mean, there have been times when there have been problems with the freezing. But I think other than that, they, as long as they're kept in a, in a deep freeze, it should be, they should be fine. But I don't know exactly. Do my, like, do they get freezer burn? I mean, you know. No, I think they're kept even lower like than that. Vegetables, you know, like in my freezer, you know. Yeah. I'm hoping it's that the technology is a little bit better for freezing eggs. I know they did worry at first about about ice crystals and things hurting, but they I guess they figured all that out. So anyway, it is being done. Okay. So it's one of being human because we can now live almost half of our lives postmenopausally, right? It's not just a short time. Yeah. We, we, you know, if you live, if you're plant based. And I was, that's why I brought up the blue zones, because the blue zones are five places in the world where, where people routinely live to 100 or more. And they're not just sitting in a nursing home getting care. They're actually very vibrant parts of, of their communities, and they're, right. they're active. And the things that they all have in common, these five places in the world, is um, they're all about 90 to 95% plant-based. They leave animal products for very special occasions. They're all eating legumes. They don't smoke. None of them smoke. They're all just generally physically active. They're just, they're, they're gardening, they're doing things, they're not just driving around their cars like in LA. And, and they have very close relationships with family and with the community. So there's, right. there's a lot of social support as well. So these, play, these people are living well into their hun hundreds. And so if we go through menopause at 52, it's, it's not the end, it's the beginning of a fantastic time of right. freedom. And if you feel well, and if you've prepared yourself, and if you prepared your body for this time, then all should be well, and you can just keep going, and you have good energy, and you have, you have, you have strong bones, and all these things that we always thought were gonna happen to us, that we're going to, we're going to have a heart attack when we're 60 like our grandparents. It doesn't have to happen. It it's doesn't. True. It's right. true. Right. But we, we, have to, we have to get the word out. We do. And if we can get people, and this is one of the reasons why we talk about this, you know, on, on numerous phone calls that we have back and forth as we're building the pregnancy advantage, getting a woman to get her body pregnant ready is going to lay the foundation not only for her, but for her child and, and for the health of both of you down the road. I mean, and the grandchildren too. Yeah. And grandchildren. Well, and I think back to this one fact, if you're a woman carrying your daughter at this, at one point, cause you're, they're, you're going to be creating the eggs of your grandchild of a female grandchild. Exactly. exactly. So think about that. Genetics. It's amazing because you are directly connected to your daughter and your granddaughter at the same time. Which I think I, is amazing. I, I know. And I used to think, because I didn't know about epigenetics, I, I used to think that what really mattered when you were pregnant, well, it didn't really matter when you were pregnant, your emotional state didn't matter when you were pregnant. And, you know, I knew something about nutrition, but not much. I thought everything that mattered about the next generation was about how you'd handled the baby after. Like if you were crying all the time, or if you were depressed, or if you were anxious, right. or if you had, you know, if you couldn't hold or snuggle, or couldn't really, I thought that was what was going to make the, per, really, make the personality of the next generation or even help the health of the next generation. But now we're learning more through epigenetics that it really has to do with, right, with the milieu, with what, what you're exposing the baby to while you're pregnant. Yep. And even before. 
it's the food and everything. I mean, it's the and food, it's the toxins, and, it's the yeah. toxins, right. Yeah. And yeah. air pollution, yeah. right. Absolutely. Speaking of toxins on August 30th, if anybody's listening, I just posted some events where I'm going to be connecting with Dr. Will Tuttle and Dr. Shang Hong Wu, <gasps> who are together talking about toxins and the health of, of not only us, but of the planet. Dr. Liu is very, very big on, on getting the toxins out. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Will Tuttle was in the movie Cowspiracy. So, and, you he's know, quite he's, magical. He's quite yeah. magical. And I, yes, and I know him too. That's he's great. He's pretty incredible. Fantastic. Will Tuttle's book, The World Peace Diet, yeah. is really remarkable. It's amazing. I, I would recommend it to anybody. Right. I mean, they say you can make a vegan in six hours. You know, have you heard this? Yeah. Right, so it's forks over knives, cowspiracy, and either dominion or or uh, or eating you alive. And the new one that's coming out in September is the Game Changers. Yes. Well, how about exercise for women going through menopause or postmenopausal? What exercise should they do? What about building muscle? You know, I right. heard that there's going to be better gains in muscle after postmenopause. Take it away, doc. Okay. I actually, this was an interesting question, but I, I'm not an exercise physiologist and I don't know if there are more muscle gains after menopause. I don't know that that's true. So I, okay. I, I defer to somebody who knows more, but you need, you should focus always on getting enough exercise and 30 minutes a day is sort of the minimal, the minimum amount of exercise, but even 30 minutes a day will actually de decrease uh, your, 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 morbidity or mortality actually so there'll be life extension if you just exercise but if you can exercise more like an hour a day it'll be better and if you could do 90 minutes a day even better they haven't done actually tested anyone doing more than 90 minutes a day because i guess there aren't that many people who do exercise more than 90 minutes a day weight bearing exercise for women is i don't know, probably also for men but weight bearing exercise for women is very important and dr clapper always talks about just getting a vest that you can put little weights into Mm -hmm. So, for example, swimming is not a weight-bearing exercise because you're weightless in the water. So that's not going to help with your, with your bones, keeping your bones strong. But walking and any kind of weightlifting. So a resistance training. And I think also focusing on uh, balance is also very important as you get older. So balance and strength training and, and a little bit of aerobic exercise is good too. But if you can just walk for a half an hour to an hour a day, it's good. I just started good. roller skating. Oh, wow. I got these cool skates. They are, I saw them go by on Facebook and I went, oh, I have to have these things. And they've got one wheel in the front, two wheels in the back, and they can Ooh. adjust and they attach right onto my sneakers. So, wonderful, wonderful. Like in the old days, we had a skate key. Do you remember the skate key? <laughs> I do, I do. No skate key for this. It automatically adjusts. So you pull it out, you step into it, and it snaps right into your foot. Wow. Strap it over and go. And so, yeah, I'm glad there wasn't anybody around me when I was doing, you know, practicing, you know, because of my maiden <laughs> voyage, you know, I fell down a couple of times. Uh, do, you have, do you have wrist? I did the hats? wrist. I had the elbows. I had the knees. I had the helmets, you know. Yeah. You know, I think that Dr. McDougall, he says things like exercise will kill you. Have you heard him say that? Because... Because you don't want to do something that you're, that's going to cause you to fall and kill yourself. I just saw someone who had fallen off a balcony doing some extreme yoga pose in Mexico. And, you know, she broke like 100. I think she broke 100 bones and she's going to be in the hospital for years. And, and so it's not worth, it's really being fit is not worth really risking your life. I watched the movie about a guy who climbed, you know, who climbs without ropes. You don't have to do anything like that. You really can just walk briskly with a weighted vest and do some yoga for balance. And, and, and I think you'll, you'll be good. And the, the most important thing is to eat a plant-based diet and get enough calcium. So can we just talk about calcium? I know we don't have to, we have one minute more, but yeah, I just want to, say, time. Go ahead. I want to say something about calcium because we're recommended to get a thousand milligrams of calcium and actually 1200 if a woman is over 50 or a man over 70. But there was an epic Oxford study out of uh, Europe. It was a very large population based study and they were looking at, at fractures and they actually saw that when women get, when women were vegan plant-based, so they're not eating a lot of acidic foods that leaches 
calcium out of your bones, but when they were plant-based and they had at least 525 milligrams of calcium, they did not have more fractures. So this is important because people are always thinking, I need to take calcium supplements, I'm not getting enough calcium, I'm not getting the, you know, the thousand milligrams of calcium. So, so you actually are probably going to be just fine if you can get you know, 600 milligrams of calcium, but eat a plant-based diet and get some exercise. Because osteoporosis is not a disease of calcium deficiency, as Dr. Clapper always intones, um, but it is about disuse. So you need, to use your, you need to use your muscles. My father used to see if, say if he saw us just lying around watching TV, use your legs or they're gonna fall off, and that's actually very true. <laughs> My <laughs> physics teacher in college connected the television to a bicycle. Oh, that's wonderful. So, so as long as you were kids, biking. Yeah. And they would like during the commercials, they would switch, you know, uh, right. the kids would switch so they could watch TV. That's great. And of course, if, if you ever watch a webinar that Dr. Greger is doing, he's always on his, he's treadmill. always on his treadmill, which can make you a little dizzy. But, but the point is we need to move and the body was made to move and you'll feel better because it actually does get right. more endorphins. But the thing about calcium is don't take supplements of calcium unless you're really deficient and someone said you absolutely have to because is calcium supplements, they, they do cause cardiovascular disease and they increase yeah. your risk and they don't help with, with fractures. So get enough calcium and it looks like from the Epic Oxford study, um, if you can get 600 milligrams of calcium and if you're on a plant-based diet, you okay. should be fine. All right. Well, what about the, we didn't get to this, thinning hair during menopause. Right. So they say that 80% of your hair is going to be growing, uh, telogen phase or antigen phase, and 19% is at rest and 1% is actually falling out um, at any one time. And if you lose about 100 hairs a day, I haven't really been counting, but if you lose more than 100 hairs a day uh, for any length of time, you should see your dermatologist because it actually, hair is a skin appendage. So I'm not an expert, because I am an office, my area, the skin, but still I did a little bit of research and what I learned about hair is that you need B vitamins to make keratin. How could I forget? Because I'm not a dermatologist and hair is not my way, my area, we were talking about estrogen and soy. Okay, keratin, so you need B vitamin, you need B6, to increase L-cysteine, which gets turned into keratin. Something else that you need is the ALA, alpha linolenic acid that becomes the long chain um, omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA, because they produce something called ceramide, or ceramide, ceramide, which keeps the, ha the hair uh, sort of lubricated or a little bit, it's a compound that keeps it from becoming brittle and breaking. So that's right. important too. And you can actually measure, I believe, you can have a blood test to measure if you're deficient in omega-3s, and some people are. And the reason that Dr. Greger actually recommends that you take some preformed DHA and EPA is because we may not be making enough of the long chain DHA and EPA, the end product, from the food sources of these essential fatty acids, which are hemp seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds, and walnuts, because we're using these enzymes to, to do that. And we may not convert very well, but you don't have to use fish Fish are just getting omega-3s because they're eating algae, and you could buy an algae-based omega-3. And Perfect. it does recommend 250 milligrams of an algae-based preformed um, DHA and EPA, and you need it also now. You can say another reason you need it, not just for your brain health, but and to prevent brain shrinkage and to make keep your brain cells working well, but also to keep the ceramide from letting your hair get brittle and breaking. You also need good circulation. You don't want very high insulin levels because that can uh, make that can interfere with the circulation because you need a lot of oxygen to your to your scalp. And then we were talking about menopause. So the problem in menopause is that we have a, a shift to a slightly more androgen based, more more testosterone than more estrogen mm -hmm. and in our hair follicles there's a hormone called 5 alpha reductase and 5 alpha reductase is what turns testosterone to something called DHT. Dihydrotestosterone, um, di and that's two and a half times more potent than testosterone, and that's going to cause the hair to fall out. I wish it would cause the chin hairs to fall out. For I goodness know. sake, I don't What's get up it. With that, obviously, I don't have all the answers here. All I know is that yes, in in menopause, because of a slightly, you know, it tilts toward more of an androgen base even for women, there is a little bit more hair loss in all the wrong places. So you might notice also thinning hair in your vulva as well and in your, in your head a little bit. I certainly have seen this when you see very elderly women who have much less hair. So the things that you can do is make sure that you get enough B vitamins and all the little nutrients, all the micronutrients you should get from, 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 from nuts and seeds and spices and fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. Yes, everything. And mushrooms. 
eight. I, I just have to ask to the world at large. Yes. Why for men do they start growing Go hair in their ears? There's a gene that codes. It's called that. It's for hairy earlobes. The hairy ear. So. Yeah, but they don't, they're not expressed like until like they get to a certain age. Thank goodness. Can you imagine if you were in like sixth or seventh grade in junior high? Can you imagine if you were 13 and had hairy earlobes? It would be terrible. That would be very bad. So On we can that just, note. Yeah. <laughs> we always have fun, right? We always have fun talking about things. Well, you gotta laugh. I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, you just gotta laugh. It's hard to laugh about chin hairs. <laughs> well, this is true. Yeah, you just gotta pluck them out, you know, once or twice. I think yes. back to, do you ever see the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. my God. You got one over there. She's like meeting <laughs> the in-laws for the first time. And you got one that's over there just going, just a minute, just a minute. You know, right. Me it's fun to see that in a, in a movie because you think you're the only one and then you realize <laughs> I know. you're not the only one. Yes. <laughs> that was a great movie. That was just absolutely. But mom, he's vegan. Oh, I make lamb. <laughs> and you know, lamb is the worst for the environment. I heard it, it actually creates the most greenhouse gases because even more than beef, because they are small animals and they actually, you need more of them to, to feed people anyway. That's what I learned at this recent green event that I was, lamb is the worst. Well, I think we've covered a wide range of topics. I think we've put <laughs> menopause to bed for, for, for right now. So, all, all right. right. All uh, right. If you have Thank any other you. topics you would like us to cover in depth, just you know, message Dr. Shapiro or myself. You can do it on Facebook. Let us know. A plant-based Westchester or a plant-based Cape Cod. You can join those groups. I know you have a page. A, a new view of food. A new view of food. food you have the of, website and a Facebook yes. page. So you can yes. contact Dr. Shapiro there or myself. And we'll dive into a you know, give us some topic ideas. We'll dive into them. So anyway. Yes. And we'll laugh about them. Exactly. And have fun. So. And we'll try to convince you to go plant-based. Plant-based. All right. So All right. on that note, we'll say good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye, Jean. Bye-bye.